Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about this um, kind of uh, argument or research plan that I've been thinking through about how um, as neuroscientists, we need to reflect on how good the analysis tools that we have are. And that to do that, it would be good to apply those tools to artificial neural networks and see where we can get with them. Uh, so I want to start with an example of kind of what is not an uncommon approach to systems neuroscience. So this is a particular paper um, from a few years ago uh, that is about motor cortex and planning um, in, in motor cortex for some simple reach movements. So in this study, um, they're um, using macaques and the animals are trained to make these simple arm movements um, where they start at the center and they reach out or um, as I'll explain, uh, it could be a little bit more complicated than that, but um, they, they make these simple movements um, and uh, what this study wanted to um, look into was how uh, the neural activity in the motor cortex represents preparation for these movements versus kind of execution for these movements. And um, this is something that's studied a lot in, in uh, the motor cortex literature. Uh, and so to do that, they have um, on the bottom here, I'm kind of showing the uh, one of their experimental um, paradigms here where on a given trial, the animal starts at the center, they're um, shown the target location where they're going to have to reach to, and then there's some sort of delay period. It could be zero milliseconds, meaning there's actually no delay up to 900 uh, milliseconds. And so during that time, they know where they're going to have to move, but they don't have to move yet. Um, and then a go queue comes on, which would tell them to just move to that target in some trials. So they wait, there's a go queue, and then they move. Or um, on some trials, there's actually a switch in the target. So they were preparing to move to one location, and then the goal of their movement changes, and they have another um, period of time where they might have uh, a delay period, or they might have to go immediately, um, and they move to that other target instead. So this is trying to study um, basically what's happening when uh, there is this delay and they almost have time to prepare the movement versus um, trials where there isn't a delay and also what happens if they prepare for one movement, but then actually have to make another movement. And so the authors record from um, neurons in motor cortex. This is an average um, uh, trajectory of the firing rates for some cells on different trials in motor cortex. But then the main thing that they do really is take this um, full population activity that they have because they can record from many neurons at once and they do a uh, dimensionality reduction on it. So they do principal components analysis to provide a description of this activity in a lower dimensional space. So this is showing as best you can in, in 2D, it's showing the first three dimensions of this lower dimensional space and what the activity looks like during the movements in this space. And so I can just walk through kind of this top example here where you start at baseline, that's the start of the trial. Um, and then the, um, in the gray case, um, the animal is uh, told that it's going to have to go to one location. And so the uh, neural activity kind of moves into what's called the preparatory state for that location. And then on this trial, uh, that location doesn't get switched. There's a go queue and then the animal uh, makes a full movement. In the red is one of the trials where there was a switch. So they were told they're going to have to go to a different location and go to the preparatory uh, activity state for that location. But then when they're told that there's a switch, uh, they go to the preparatory state for uh, the other location they have to go to, and then when the go queue comes, they actually make that move. So on uh, the top here, I'm showing examples where there's a long delay where they have time to go to the uh, preparatory state of the second movement before the go queue comes on. Because there's variable delay, as I showed you, there could be as little as no delay where the go queue and the, um, uh, the target change information comes on at the same time. Uh, when there's a very short delay, uh, they kind of maybe swing by the preparatory state of the first uh, of the movement that they're doing, but they don't actually have to go all the way to the same preparatory location. So that's kind of one of the main results of this uh, paper was that when the movement plan changes, they don't have to go all the way to the preparatory state, um, but they do kind of, you know, if, if they have a little bit of time, they're going to go towards the preparatory state, but then if the go queue comes on, they'll just abandon the goal of the preparatory state and they'll just make the movement. Um, so that's what these, uh, you know, visualizations in lower dimensions helped the authors realize about how the system was working. And so they even kind of, uh, end the paper with this simple schematic of what they're saying is kind of their updated view of motor cortex, where they're kind of combining different ideas from previous work. Um, and they're, uh, saying how these, um, these kind of different 
uh, studies before them that didn't uh, look at kind of changes of target location um, during preparatory activity, how they're kind of incorporating uh, different aspects of those to say there's, there's kind of two systems involved here where um, if you uh, have time, so if you're looking at the, the right side of this figure here, um, in the case where uh, they're told to go to a, uh, they're going to go to a certain target and they have a delay, they just go to the preparatory state for that target and they wait there, the neural activity waits there. Um, and then the red and blue kind of show you different trials where they'd have more or less time to replan by going to the second preparatory state once, once the target was switched. And basically it's just saying kind of, you know, there's this attractor that pulls um, the, the neural activity to the second preparatory state, but if the go queue comes, then they just abandon it and they go. Um, and that's what you're seeing on the bottom here. Now, this doesn't really explain well um, why on even trials where the go queue and the, um, the new target are presented simultaneously. So when there's zero delay for that second target, uh, you still see this effect of the neural activity kind of going to the second preparatory state before it goes to the movement, because you would imagine that uh, if you got the go queue and the new target information at the same time, you would just abandon any attempt to go to the preparatory state and just go straight into the movement. Um, and so they have to kind of appeal to this idea that um, there's some other system that's sending the information into the motor cortex and that system doesn't send the go queue at the same time as the um, target information. Even if that information is presented to the animal at the same time, the go queue and the target are presented at the same time, they're just kind of saying, well, whatever system is sending the go queue could be monitoring the preparatory state. And first it tells the, the motor cortex where it's going to have to go, and then it waits to send the, the go queue to motor cortex. Um, but they can't really say what system is responsible for that or have any kind of evidence of that because they're only recording from um, the motor cortex. So that's a study that uses a somewhat common tool in um, uh, systems neuroscience, which is dimensionality reduction and visualization of neural dynamics. Um, it provides at the end a kind of updated account, an updated story of how to think about uh, motor cortex dynamics. Um, and but it 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 has some acknowledged you know lackings and that there's part of their story that uh, isn't really explained, and so um, I feel like this you know as I said is kind of representative of a lot of papers in systems neuroscience, um, especially ones that don't involve any perturbations where you're just kind of observing neural activity and analyzing it. And so my question is, are these analysis tools that we're applying to observe neural activity? Are they actually providing us with accurate and productive models of how the brain works? Does the outcome of that process of doing that analysis on that data and coming up with this new story, is that actually useful? <laughs> Are we making progress in neuroscience by applying these tools? And my argument is that we can't be super certain that we are um, and that to uh, vet our tools and to test them, uh, we should apply them to artificial neural networks. And so I'm going to explain why we should apply our tools specifically to artificial neural networks to test them. And then I'll get into a little bit of a more detailed plan of exactly how that testing would work. So there's three main reasons why artificial neural networks are um, suitable as a test bed for the tools of systems neuroscience, and that's their um, similarity to real neural networks, which I'll start with as the first one. Um, and so basically artificial neural networks were, uh, when they were invented back in the 40s and 50s, they were inspired by the physiology of real neurons. So they take in inputs, they weigh each of those inputs individually, they sum them up, and pass them through some kind of nonlinearity, and that produces an output. And that's kind of the same thing as dendrites taking in weighted inputs through their synapses, um, and then the cell performs its own nonlinearity in terms of um, spiking mechanisms and all that. And then the output of the cell, uh, if it spikes or not, is sent to other neurons as its own signal, and the process repeats itself. So just in their basic design, artificial neurons are supposed to work roughly like how artificial neural networks are, or, or sorry, how real neurons are. And then um, when you put all of these neurons together and you set the, um, the strength of the connections between them just right, you can get the network to do uh, things that are interesting and related to what real neural networks can do. So you can train these networks by usually um, using backpropagation where you put in uh, the kind of correct answer that you want the network to get out 
and you update the weights of the network accordingly so that it produces that correct answer. And so this is relying on uh, the connections between neurons as the kind of things that implement the interesting computations that neural networks do. And I mean, that's kind of how we view real neurons as well, that the connections that they make with other neurons are very important. And um, we want to study those and understand um, how those connections lead to uh, the computations that the brain can do. Now, it is the case that um, this exact way of setting the weights with backpropagation is, um, you know, considered not biologically plausible. And um, I'll get a little bit more into that later uh, to the extent that that's relevant for what I'm saying here. Um, but just to say that you can make the networks do interesting things, and that's relevant for using them to study um, the tools of systems neuroscience, because a lot of our tools are about connecting kind of neural dynamics to computation and behavior. So having a model that can do computation and behavior is important. Um, and then on top of the kind of basic inspiration um, that artificial neurons have from real neurons, there's also uh, uh, certain types of artificial neural networks that take even more inspiration uh, from the brain. So for example, convolutional neural networks were inspired by some of the basic computations that are implemented in the visual system. Um, so, for example, the convolutions and convolutional neural networks look for simple patterns in an, uh, an image, and that's like what simple cells do in primary visual cortex. Um, and then the pooling layers in these networks um, try to average over a spatial location so that you get spatial invariance uh, in the responses, and that's the same as complex cells in the primary visual cortex. And then when you stack these um, convolution and pooling operations, you kind of replicate the full ventral visual string. So not just um, primary visual cortex, but you kind of repeat the process to um, mimic what other cortical areas do as well. Uh, and then also uh, recurrent neural networks um, uh, are you know, they're very basic in that they're just kind of allowing connections amongst neurons that can form loops, um, but they've been used a lot as models in neuroscience as well because there's obviously a lot of recurrent connections in the brain. And so studying how uh, neural dynamics can be generated with artificial neural networks that were trained to perform a dynamic task, um, that's been a, a fruitful application as well. So there's um, just in their design and inspiration, uh, there is a similarity between artificial neural networks in the brain and also um, they've been built as successful models to explain um, certain aspects of neural dynamics and uh, behavior. Uh, and then on top of that, you can make them even more biologically realistic if you want to. Um, so there's kind of a, a base type of artificial neural network that has some level of similarity, um, but people are working on, so on the left here, I'm showing an example of a spiking neural network. So instead of just outputting um, a continuous value that would be interpreted as a rate, you can actually have spike times if you're interested in state and spike times. Um, you can also incorporate um, different cell types. So on the right, I'm showing red and blue excitatory inhibitory cell types in a, a network model that you can put into an artificial neural network. Um, and so you can really bring in a lot of detail if you have a specific reason to want to incorporate that detail into the artificial neural network. But importantly, to use artificial neural networks as um, a test bed for the tools of system neuroscience, it doesn't mean that the artificial neural networks have to work exactly like the brain. Because there's a lot of debate about um, okay, if you train an artificial neural network to do object recognition, it can predict real neural activity to some extent, but there's also definitely big differences in how these two systems work. And those are all fair, um, you know, research questions and those are, um, uh, you know, real observed differences between the systems. But the question of whether you can apply the tools of system neuroscience to study artificial neural networks doesn't depend on them working identically. And that's clear when we apply the same tools to different species. <laughs> when we apply uh, an analysis method to data that's collected from humans versus macaques, or even from mouse, or even from C. elegans, you know, there are some analysis methods that we could apply to any of these species. It doesn't mean that we think that all of those species brains are working the same way. It just means that this is an analysis that could help us understand each of them. Um, and in fact, the way that we usually compare artificial neural networks to the brain is to perform an analysis on them and then do a comparison, which implicitly suggests that they are similar enough that they can be subjected to the same analysis. So, for example, with um, recurrent neural networks, this is a, a diagram um, that shows kind of you 
uh, make the recurrent neural network and you collect neural data and you do dimensionality reduction on both of them and you come up with a kind of low dimensional description of what they're both doing and then you see if they're working the same. And so that tells us that applying this dimensionality reduction approach is something we're allowed to do to either of those and we assume that the thing we get back from, from that analysis on, on both systems is comparable. So to say that we can apply the same tools doesn't mean that they have to work the same. In fact, the tools are usually how we determine if they're working the same or not. So the next reason that um, artificial neural networks are uh, suitable or even uh, preferred as a means of testing uh, our tools is that they are kind of a perfect experimental setting in that they're fully observable and perturbable. So uh, when it comes to performing an analysis method, there's no worry about simultaneous recording of neurons or can you record from multiple brain regions at once or multiple areas in the network at once. You can record from every neuron in the neural network um, under all experimental conditions. Whatever data you want to collect out of it, you can. You can also collect all of the connectivity data. So um, no experimental limitations uh, in, in artificial neural networks. And then um, once you apply the analysis methods, uh, you also want to be able to kind of test um, the understanding that you get from them. And I'm going get, to get more into that later. But for that side of things, it's also very beneficial that you can make any perturbation you want in this network. So obviously, experimentally, um, you know, if you wanted to uh, stimulate one neuron and uh, suppress the neuron that was next to it, you know, those kinds of things are difficult to do in a real brain. Um, but in an artificial neural network, they're trivial. You can do any kind of perturbation across the whole network, two individual neurons, two individual connections, anything you want can be done. You can also do kind of developmental interventions in the uh, sense that you can change how the network is trained to see how that uh, impacts how it works and all of that. So really just an amazing environment for um, performing experiments. Uh, and this is just an example from a study I did on attention um, where I perturbed neural activity at a given layer in an artificial neural network and then measured the activity or recorded from the activity at uh, the layer subsequent to it to see how that uh, perturbation at one layer kind of trickles down through the network. And I'm showing on the right here just kind of a, uh, the findings from that, the details aren't that important, but it's just to say that you can put in these perturbations, and in this case, you could see how the effect of them actually fades away as it travels through the network, whereas at some layers, when you put in the perturbations, the effect actually stays robust. Um, and so that was just a, a way of using this kind of ideal experimental setting to study something about, uh, in this case, how visual attention could be helping um, the visual system perform challenging tasks. And so the importance of having this um, complete experimental environment, uh, one, it removes the possibility of what I showed in that first study of appealing to unknown factors. In that first study that I showed you in the motor cortex, there was a sense of, well, there's some other area that separates the go cue from the target information and introduces a delay, and that's what we have to assume to make our model work. If you can record from everything and you don't find the area that does that, then you know that your model's wrong. <laughs> so getting rid of the possibility of saying there's some part of the system we don't know about, um, but we have to make an assumption about, that's very helpful when um, trying to apply these analysis tools. And then also it just expedites the process of vetting the tools because you can perform an analysis and then you can perform an experiment to see if that analysis gave you a correct insight and you can do that rapidly versus experimentally. A lot of times you simply can't do the experiment that you'd want to do uh, or if you can, it's going to take two more years of, of work. Um, so those are the reasons why it matters that we use ANNs versus um, kind of trying to test our tools simply on the data that we have already. And then the last reason is that we do have an ignorance of how they work algorithmically. Um, so uh, artificial neural networks are considered a black box, uh, meaning that you train these big networks and they can perform the task that you explicitly train them on, but kind of how they do that, um, how they're making their decisions, that kind of thing, um, that's usually considered unknown with these networks. Um, and um, that's kind of considered a problem in, in using them in the real world is that uh, we don't know how they work. Um, and even this one article says that these artificial neural, neural networks are unfortunately as opaque as the brain. <laughs> so we don't know how the brain works and we don't know how artificial neural networks work. So we're um, in the same position there. Um, but yet there is a whole field around trying to understand artificial neural networks, um, sometimes called explainable AI or methods for interpretable AI. 
Um, and the idea there is that there is something you could extract from this trained model that will give you some insights into how it's doing the job that it's doing and that that could help a human understand how to use this tool and kind of when to trust it and when not to trust it. So people who use artificial neural networks, even in a machine learning applied sense, do believe to some extent that there is something that could be understood about them, even though when you train them, you don't immediately get that understanding. You could apply methods um, that lead you to that understanding. And so in this way, it's kind of the same as we feel about the brain. The brain doesn't immediately tell us how it works, but we think we can apply methods to it to understand how it works. Um, but so something that um, I kind of need to make explicit uh, to you know, argue my case here is I need to have some sense of what neuroscientists want from their data analysis tools um, if we're going to test if those tools are providing what they want. And that's tough. <laughs> different neuroscientists want different things. Um, I'm trying to focus kind of on systems neuroscience here, which is at least a little bit more specific. But I think a lot of times what neuroscientists want is something like Mars algorithmic level um, of understanding or of description. And so, um, for those who don't know, Mars levels, there's three levels. The computational level tells you what the goal of a system is, like what problem is it trying to solve. Um, in this bird case, it's, you know, the bird needs to fly. The algorithm is what steps does it take to achieve that goal? So, in this case, flapping. And then implementation is usually like the, the physical implementation. Um, in this case, wings or feathers. But in the brain, it would be what neurons are connected to what neurons that implement this algorithm so that it, the system can achieve the goal that it's trying to achieve. Um, and I know there's kind of a lot of, uh, there's a lot of baggage to using uh, Mars levels and, and people have different feelings about them. I'm not trying to be too focused on that being as what um, neuroscientists want, but I think, you know, it does point in the right direction. Um, I would clarify that when neuroscientists use these data analysis tools, they're not actually looking for a real algorithm, like not like such a precise thing that a computer could immediately implement. Um, it's more of a simplified story that offers some predictive ability. So, you know, you have some understanding of the system that says, okay, well, if I did this experiment, this is what would happen, but it's not a super quantitative detailed description. So it's related to what I showed in that motor um, uh, system example, where you kind of end up with this figure that says, okay, this is the schematic we can have in our head when we think about this system. That's kind of what people are trying to get out um, by using these analysis tools. So it's something that humans can comprehend, but it's just kind of a simple story of the uh, steps that the system follows. And one example of this that I think has been pretty successful is to think of the ventral visual stream that's doing object recognition as untangling. Um, this was uh, 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 put forth by Jim DiCarlo and David Cox in this um, paper and, and many studies before and after. But uh, the idea is, you know, how do we think about the ventral visual stream? We know that it can do object recognition. We know that it can do invariant object recognition, meaning that, uh, you know, you can show the same object in different positions or poses or under different lighting conditions, and we can still recognize it. And, um, like, it's known that uh, neurons, particularly at the end of the ventral visual system in areas like IT, have somewhat invariant responses to um, objects in different positions. And so uh, what they kind of propose is this um, manifold state space way of thinking about it, where uh, in V1, the images of two different objects, in this case, they're using two different um, people, so um, identity, uh, the, the images at kind of a V1 level are all mixed up. If you just looked at V1, you can't tell the difference between these two different people. And in fact, V1 is going to care more about things like lighting or pose or position because those are low level features that are going to create kind of the same simple patterns that V1 cares about. Um, you could similarly say that in pixel space, the uh, image of, of two different people can be very similar because faces are all overall very similar, but we know we can tell them apart at a, a higher level. Um, and so uh, what they're kind of advocating here is for a view of thinking of the ventral visual stream as a series of steps that untangles these manifolds and makes them nice and smooth and separate. Uh, and so by the time you get to IT, the uh, neural activity representing one person is very different from the neural activity representing another person. And therefore you can make this distinction. Uh, so this is uh, an updated view of um, based on kind of what people previously described IT as, and that's what they're showing in C here, where 
the neural activity was kind of completely invariant. And so you didn't have a full manifold. You just had a kind of a point in space for each person. This view acknowledges in this kind of untangling manifold way that no, you'll still get variations and responses, but the goal of the system and the steps that it takes to achieve that goal are to untangle this manifold. Um, so that's kind of, you know, roughly the level of understanding or example of the type of understanding that it seems like people are trying to get at in systems neuroscience. Um, so you could argue um, that the fact that we don't have that level of, of understanding for artificial neural networks makes them a bad uh, place to test our tools because we don't have the ground truth. So how do we know if when we apply our tools that we're going to, um, to get the right answer? How do we test if we got the right answer? And for this reason, a lot of people use simulated data when they um, propose a new method. So for example, here I'm showing a method whose goal is to be able to detect sequences within a larger pattern of neural activity. And so the uh, people who made this method generated simulated data where they put in this uh, certain, these three different sequences uh, into a larger neural activity pattern. And then they show on the top here that their method is successfully recovering when those different sequences appear. And so in this case, you know the answer, you built the system to work a certain way and you use um, your method to show that your method can pull out the correct answer. And that makes a lot of sense for kind of testing the like base validity of the method that it works as you want it to. But I would say that um, when we're trying to get at this kind of algorithmic understanding, when you, if you know the answer in advance, if you go into the analysis of the system with the story in your mind of how it works, then you're not going to be able to be an accurate judge of whether your methods uh, recovered that story, because uh, you know you're going to be guided in your analysis and in your interpretation of the methods to uh, make you feel like it led you to the answer that you already had. So knowing the answer in advance can be misleading. And then also a part of what um, I think that neuroscientists need to grapple with is to decide what we actually want out of the tools and decide what understanding is. And so when you don't have the right, you don't have an answer in mind is what you're trying to work towards, you have to decide, okay, I actually think I've gotten to a point where I understand this artificial neural network well enough to say that this tool was useful in, in creating that understanding. So it, it forces a definition of understanding where we don't really have any. Uh, there is the question of whether artificial neural networks can be understood. Um, people do say that this is kind of hopeless to even attempt to create this kind of lower dimensional description of how they work. Um, and, uh, you know, that could be fair. I think if it's true, then it's also true for the brain. And so, and people have made that argument as well, that um, we should kind of abandon trying to understand the representations that exist in the brain and just think about our understanding in terms of um, what is the architecture, what is the objective function, what is the learning rule? So that's this deep learning framework for neuroscience. Um, and yeah, just kind of give up on, on trying to make sense of a trained system in isolation, but more think about how it, it came about and how it was trained. Um, so I would say that um, it seems unlikely to me that there really is no reduction we can do. Like the idea that to describe how a neural network works, you simply have to list all of the weights of the neural network because there's simply no way to make that description any more compact. That seems unlikely to me. And we can already see in methods that um, actually try to prune neural networks um, that you can get rid of a lot of the weights and um, they'll still work pretty well. So there's clearly some sort of kind of reduced system that exists inside these neural networks. Um, and I imagine there's something that we can say that would give us a slightly more intuitive understanding about how they work um, rather than just giving up entirely. But that's an empirical question. But I think if we try to understand artificial neural networks and realize that we can't get the type of understanding that feels satisfying, that is relevant to neuroscience to know um, what we should be expecting about what we can understand. So that was kind of why artificial neural networks are suitable. I'm gonna quickly go through how I would advocate for actually um, testing uh, the tools on, on artificial neural networks and kind of verifying that the tools are useful or not. So the basic uh, setup is just that you apply an analysis to tool to a variety of artificial neural networks with different structures and, and train on different tasks. Um, and then you kind of reflect on how well that tool um, provided understanding of that network. 
And uh, for the type of understanding that I'm thinking about here, I'm calling closed loop understanding. It's not a great name for it, but it looks something like this. So basically, you start with an artificial neural network that you've trained to do some task. You apply some data analysis method. That method ideally provides you with some simpler model of how that system works, just like in, in the motor cortex example. You get some simplified model that you can go off of for thinking about how the system works. Then you have to use that simplified model to motivate an experiment that tests it. So you have the story that you tell yourself about how the system works that should lead to some sort of experiment that you could implement where you could verify if that story is correct or not. And again, because you can do whatever you want in artificial neural networks, uh, it, you shouldn't be limited by the experimental technique. You can just do whatever should test that story. Um, and then if that uh, experiment comes back and says, yes, your simple story was correct, you were able to correctly predict the outcome of this experiment, now you have a new understanding of the neural system, which will probably lead you to new analysis methods and new questions you want to ask about the system and the process can kind of repeat. But the key thing is that the method should give you an output that is some sort of understanding, and then that understanding should be able to be verified with an experiment. So the tools that I'm thinking about that can be applied, this is just kind of the specifics of, of what are the tools of systems neuroscience. Um, dimensionality and reduction I mentioned is a big one. This is used for visualization. It's also used for um, kind of uh, getting rid of what's considered the noisy parts of the neural activity uh, and other things. There's a lot of different methods out there for dimensionality reduction now. Um, latent factor modeling is somewhat related to dimensionality reduction, but um, Kind of can incorporate more of a, a guess about how the system is working, like um, how the latent factors might um, interact with each other and how they relate to neural activity. Uh, this is an example that tries to pull out latent um, factors related to reinforcement learning um, through the process of learning. Um, representational similarity analysis is used a lot now to compare artificial neural networks to the brain, but also as a way to study neural activity because you can ask if a given brain area is kind of encoding or representing uh, certain information in a specific way, or you can look at how the representation of information is changed across brain areas. Uh, so that's a common tool. Uh, representation geometry is maybe a little bit newer of a category of really trying to um, kind of use more precise definitions from topology and thinking about manifolds and really describing kind of the shape of neural population activity. Um, and thinking about how information is transformed via changing these shapes. Uh, network analysis and network neuroscience usually starts by defining some sort of graph that relates to the brain that can actually be a structural graph, or it can be functional in the sense that it's just which neural um, populations are correlated. Uh, and then they do kind of graph theory based uh, analyses on top of that to see how um, communication across areas and things like that can change in different task circumstances. Uh, and then coding models are a large class of, of models, but um, in some ways, some of the most basic um, tools of systems neuroscience, for example, just looking at a tuning curve, kind of asserting that uh, a given neuron cares about um, a certain uh, stimulus or a certain thing in the environment and plotting how its activity changes as a function of that uh, stimulus. Uh, all, this also include, includes um, kind of like regression models and other ways of trying to get out, you know, what, what is this neuron encoding? And then there's just a lot of um, methods that are developed in, individually for specific papers um, where, you know, people collected a certain type of data and they come up with a series of analysis steps to pull out whatever information they wanted from that. Um, artificial neural networks are maybe a good place to test those because they don't generally get tested outside of the study that they're used in. Um, and uh, you can train a neural network to kind of replicate the exact experimental setting uh, as best as possible. Uh, so this is just a, a slightly more in-depth example of kind of what the process of applying a method to a network and evaluating its performance would be. So I'm using as an example here, DMIX principal components analysis, which is a form of um, dimensionality reduction that explicitly tries to separate different experimental uh, components in the activity space. Um, so, for example, here, I'm showing a network that's trained to classify images of digits, but those digits have different types of uh, noise added to them to make the, the task more challenging. And so you could apply this DMIX PCA and um, one result could be that it doesn't do a good job of demixing, meaning that it can't find 
different elements of the neural activity that relate to the digit identity versus the noise that's on the image. Um, in which case, kind of the analysis was applied, but the outcome was uh, null or inconclusive. We just the analysis method didn't return anything of use. Um, you could also imagine that it actually successfully separates um, activity in the population into activity that kind of represents the digit identity and activity that represents the noise. Um, and that then now there's something that's kind of actionable, or at least there's a, a basis for some sort of story or understanding um, when uh, we think about how this network works. And so here I'm showing an example where you perform a follow up experiment to test the understanding where you perturb activity in the neural network aligned with the different components with the assumption that if you uh, decrease, you know, the activity associated with the noise, then you'll get better performance. If you increase the activity associated with the digit identity, you should also get better performance. So there's kind of a natural experiment that comes out of uh, these results. And so you can imagine that you do that and indeed you get the performance changes you would expect in the network. And so we can say that the uh, insight that uh, DMIX PCA provided us here was confirmed, which is like the best outcome you could expect for the tool or the um, insight could not be confirmed, meaning you do the experiment um, and it, it doesn't actually, um, uh, perturbing activity on these dimensions doesn't actually lead to the expected results, meaning that the kind of the story you got from the DMIX PCA was wrong. And so that kind of gives um, some tears to, you know, if you get a method that never even gives you enough to design an experiment based on it, that's pretty bad. If you can at least design experiments based on it, that's good. And if your experiments confirm what the analysis said, that's even better. And so in the end, if you kind of do this uh, setup with a bunch of neural networks that are trained uh, and have different architectures or trained on different tasks and a bunch of, um, Different analysis methods, you kind of get this. You would end up with, you know, a uh, a chart that uh, kind of tells you how well each one does in, in each setting. And um, I've been focusing kind of on thinking of it as looking at the rows of this table, where you look at how well a given method does across a bunch of circumstances. But depending on the research interests, it may be more sensible to kind of focus on a certain type of network and see which uh, methods do the best at explaining that network. Um, but either way, you've got to get a sense of where certain tools are uh, best used in the space of uh, neural networks. Uh, and then there's a little bit of a, you know, uh, a concern about, is it fair to test the tools of systems neuroscience on artificial neural networks? Um, I think, and it usually is the case for most methods, um, there's kind of a clear uh, set of properties that the data needs to have for you to be able to apply that method to it. And so if artificial neural networks produce data that has those properties, then you can apply the method. There shouldn't be a reason why you can't apply a certain method to, um, to a neural network um, just because it was designed to study the brain. Um, there, you know, there are some caveats and uh, corner cases and things like that, and it could require that um, the network uh, needs to be adapted to be, uh, to have a certain method applied to it. So for example, uh, something that's studied a lot in systems neuroscience is noise correlations, um, and that requires that the network has noise <laughs> in its activity. And most of these artificial neural networks don't have any intrinsic noise to them. They're, if you show the same input twice, you get the exact same response from all the uh, the neurons in the network. And uh, kind of the noisiness clearly isn't uh, part of their functioning. But the a lot of the analyses that rely on noise correlations do kind of assume a role of noise or of synchronous activity uh, that just wouldn't be present in most artificial neural networks. So if you wanted to test um, the utility of, of looking at noise correlations, you need to put a lot of work into thinking about how to build an artificial neural network that actually potentially uses noise correlations in some way um, before you could really um, kind of uh, fairly test that analysis method. I think some people more um, have a concern that you can't apply the same tools to artificial neural networks due to not any kind of like technical um, rules about the method, but more of a general sense, again, that kind of artificial neural networks are just too different from the brain. And therefore, we won't get an accurate sense of how good the tools are if we um, apply them to artificial neural networks. I think that vague claim would need to be made more specific. And sometimes people point to things like, Oh, well, the brain is more modular. It's not this just huge distributed system, um, or it's the result of evolution and that, you know, puts certain constraints on how it can work, or it's not trained with backpropagation. It uses local learning rules, that kind of thing. 
and it maybe it is the case that we've kind of built tools that work on systems with those properties because that is what the brain is. Um, but it would be good if we were explicit about that, like to know that our tools rely on those assumptions. And then also a lot of those can be incorporated into um, artificial neural networks. You can put more modularity into an artificial neural network. There's been a lot of progress on using local learning rules to train them. Um, and so we could see, you know, if we build a network with these assumptions built in, uh, do the tools then work better? And that would be interesting to know as well. Uh, so, to summarize, I'm just arguing that we should use artificial neural networks um, to test the tools of systems neuroscience in this very kind of explicit, uh, iterative way. Um, and also, you know, that it, we're kind of in need of this testing because we can't tell right now if um, if our tools are, you know, really the most productive in getting us to the type of understanding we want. Um, and I also just provide a, a somewhat explicit roadmap for how we could do uh, that kind of testing. Thank you.